How's everybody doing? It's good to see y'all. We're going to start with hymn number three tonight, Worthy of Worship. Hymn number three. Why don't y'all stand? y'all be seated. I'm really proud of you guys. You sing the right words even when I don't. <laughs> I turned it on. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, Earlier Dave asked me, do I, I need did, to turn yeah. that on for you? And I, I said no, for you to come, and he though, turned so. it on for me. <laughs> Tonight I'll be reading from Titus chapter 3, um, starting in verse 1. And it's interesting, Titus is written to a pastor, um, but like all of the pastoral epistles, they apply to all of us equally. Um, we as we mature in our Christian walk, we have a responsibility to look out for those who aren't quite as spiritually mature as us and um, help them behave in the right way. And Titus here is receiving instruction from Paul on how to behave when you're living among um, ungodly people. And he says, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to avoid fighting and to be kind, always showing gentleness to all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out this Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. It's a harsh reality that we have to think about that this passage is day by day becoming more and more relevant to us, that we see the culture around us becoming more and more ungodly. And Paul reminds us that we have a responsibility um, to obey what has been given to us um, because we once were ungodly as well. We once were unrighteous as well, but not our righteousness saves us, but that righteousness that Christ poured upon us, and that comes with a responsibility, a responsibility to be different 
than the world. And so I hope that you reflect on that as we pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for tonight. I thank you um, for fellowship. I just thank you for this intimate bond that you give to the church, um, to know each other as a brother, as a sister, um, to know you as our Father, Lord. I just thank you for that, dear Lord, and I just pray that as we have come into your house tonight, that we would honor you, that we would give you all of the glory, the honor, the praise, the adoration, the love that you deserve. God, we know that we are a people of unclean lips, but we pray that um, that little bit that we can lift up to you um, would just let your light shine among us, dear Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andy. I'm going to remember to turn this off tonight. I didn't last week. So uh, moving on. Hymn number 607. What a day that will be. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know the self. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus. 
amen and turn on over to 279 there is a redeemer Everybody, I think it's evening. It's awfully bright out there. Glad you guys came uh, tonight, even in the midst of looks like uh, spring out there. It is uh, looking like a good day, I think. But I'm glad you guys made it out to uh, this to our Heavenly Father and prayerfully hear the Word of God as well this evening. And so we are in Mark chapter. Th- Mark chapter 13, we're picking up in verse 14, we'll go down to verse 23, and uh, I believe that uh, this passage is obviously is a continuation of last week, uh, but it, it's, it's talking about the end times, and we're going to get to that, and uh, we'll talk about that, so let me, let me bring up speed to make sure we're all on the same page, so the... Uh, Last week of Christ's earthly ministry, that's where we're at here in Mark chapter 13. This is Tuesday of Passion Week, so Sunday uh, was the triumphant entry, then we had the Monday, and then we have Tuesday, and Tuesday's been going on for quite some time. This thing is just cutting out left and right. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to switch to number five. Nah, I just replaced them. That's really driving me crazy. All right, is that better? Okay, good, because it was driving me nuts. All right, so uh, this is, again, Tuesday, Passion Week. Uh, So tomorrow would be Wednesday, which was the silent Wednesday, which we're not going to get into uh, tonight. So this is the Tuesday. If you remember, he spent all day uh, battling with with uh, the scribes, the Pharisees. They came to him three different on three different occasions. He, he battles them. He gives his response. Now they're walking out of of the temple, and then uh, then that's where that puts us in verse thir- or chapter thirteen. And now he goes to the Mount of Olives in verse five, and he is sitting there and he is speaking to his disciples about all that's going to happen. The big question that he is answering is verse 4. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? That's the question from the disciples. Remember, there are four of them, two sets of brothers, sitting there uh, with Jesus uh, at at the Mount of Olives. Everybody picturing this? Yeah, if you've been there, you can really picture it. Right, Brother Dave? All right, very good. So they're there, they're sitting, we've got four guys with them, and, and they ask this question, they, they know what's going to happen, kind of, and they ask him, when is it going to happen, what's it going to look like, how are we going to know, all right? This is the longest 
response that we see in all of Scripture to any question. Right here, uh, the Olivet Discourse, again, is what we call it. Uh, again, I don't really care uh, what you want to call it. But it is a, an answer to the question, all right? And the question is, how are we going to know when we're going to know, all right? And, and, and what that is is, how are we going to know when the end time has come? What's it going to look like, all right? And then he goes into thir- uh, all the way to uh, verse 13, which we talked about last week. Now we pick up in verse 14. He says this. But when you see the abomination of desolation, standing where it should not be, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one who is on the housetop must not go down or go into anything about uh, out of his house. And the one who is in the field must not turn back to get his coat. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray... Pray that it may not happen in the winter, for those days will be a time of tribulation such as not has occurred, such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation, which God created until now and never will. Unless the Lord has shortened those days, no life would have been saved, but for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then... If anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or behold, he is there, do not believe him. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But take heed. Behold, I have told you everything in advance. All right. So uh, really what I understood in all of that was take heed. Behold, I have told you everything in advance. Okay, great. That, that was a joke. Well, actually, it really wasn't. Actually, it really wasn't a joke. Uh, when, we, when we talk about the end time, we talk about eschatology, which is the study of the end times. Really, it's one of my least favorite things to talk about. Is that, is that okay to say from the pulpit? Is that okay? It's, it's one of my least favorite things to talk about. Um, it, it is one of my least favorites because... I don't really know anything about it. And I think that it is, I think it is written in such a way that, that we cannot be dogmatic about one way or the other. I really feel the eschatology, the end times, the study of the end times, really kind of fits into the Calvinistic Arminian uh, conversation. You, you understand the Calvinistic Arminian conversation? Everybody knows, right? I, I really believe that we cannot be dogmatic on one side or the other. I think that Scripture gives us plenty of references for both sides. All right, and so I think that's some of why I struggle with eschatology. I struggle a little bit with the end times because I, I like to know the absolute. I like to know what's going to happen. I would really wish that he would put it on a on a calendar and say, "This is what's going to happen on this day. This is what's going to happen on this day," because that's how I work in life. All right. But I think as an affront to me solely, solely as an affront to me, he did not do that, all right? But we're going to walk through this nonetheless, and I'm going to show you what I know to be true and what I know not to be true, speculation, as it were, okay? Everybody with me? Everybody good? And it is the best that I can do for you this evening, all right? Here we go. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, that's the first part of, of Mark chapter 13 and verse 14. Well, we know from the parallel passage in Matthew 24, 15. Again, this is the parallel passage uh, of what's going on here. It's Matthew 24, 15. It says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet. All right. So Matthew adds a key note for you and for me. And what he is saying is he's obviously uh, quoting from Daniel, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. But the abomination itself refers to that which is detestable, foul, immoral, blasphemous, and abhorrent to God. All right, everybody good with with, with this word abomination? All right, great. So uh, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. This is the exact same word uh, used here. But those who deal faithfully are his delight. Revelation 21, 27 
gives a warning to all of us. It says, and nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. All right, so this is the word abomination that we understand. Again, detestable, foul, immoral, blasphemous, and abhorrent. The book of Daniel, again, this is something that we, we know uh, he is quoting from. He's quoting from Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. Forces from him will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice, and they will set up the abomination of desolation. All right, so we know for sure... Uh, that, that this is the last week of Christ's uh, earthly ministry. We know for sure he's in the uh, Mount of Olives. We know for sure that he is uh, quoting from the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. Now, it gets a little sketchy after that, all right? Most scholars will go with this, and this is probably what you have, have deemed to be true. If you've studied this at all, uh, you probably just read this and, and knew this to be true, even though, uh, again, this is a little bit of speculation. Is he talking about uh, the Maccabean Revolt here? All right, so how many of us have heard about the Maccabean Revolt, intertestaments? Or t okay, good, great, very good. So everybody knows then uh, Antiochus IV or Antiochus Epiphanes. Everybody's heard of him or not. Doesn't really matter. He controlled Israel from 175 to 165 BC. He called himself Theos Epiphanes, which means manifest God. Antiochus des desecrated the temple in Jerusalem. Here's what he did. You guys ready? If you're not familiar with Antiochus Epiphanes, here, here's why he was so terrible and horrible. What he did was he went into the temple in Jerusalem and he sacrificed a pig on the altar. Everybody understands pig, right? It's a bad thing. Everybody good with that? All right. So he takes a pig into the temple and he, and he slaughters it. Not only does he slaughter it, he forces the priest to eat its meat. Yeah, right? And then he splashes the blood all over everything to make sure everything is desecrated with the pig's blood. Then he erects an idol of Zeus. Everybody knows Zeus, the god of all gods, right? Which we know him not to be, but that's what they believe Zeus was, okay? Uh, with ruthless abandon, Antiochus uh, oppressed the Jewish people, slaughtering thousands and selling many more into slavery. All right. So when he when he did this, when he slaughtered this pig on the altar, that was kind of the the final straw. Ju uh, Judas, no, not Judas. Um, Judah, Judah Maccabeus had had enough, and so he created this revolt. Uh, and so they call it the Maccabean Revolt. It was when the Jews got together to overthrow uh, Antiochus Epiphanes and take back the temple. Everybody, everybody, good. All right, by the way, uh, they did that, and they celebrated that, which is what we celebrate, we, not us and we, but we uh, celebrate, and it is called what? Hanukkah. Very good. That is Hanukkah. Uh, and when you celebrate Hanukkah, you are actually celebrating the Maccabean revolt, revolt how they came and they took uh, the temple back from Antiochus Epiphanes, and they were able to offer sacrifices again and, and do what they needed to do. Is everybody with me? They didn't lose anybody? Okay, great. So most scholars, and that's, that's not very debatable, that's pretty, uh, pretty common throughout uh, the scholars, is this is what uh, the first step of what God is, or what Jesus is talking about in, the, uh, in, in Mark chapter 13. However, the desecration of the temple by Antiochus Epiphanes, many scholars believe was only a foreshadowing of the Antichrist future perversion. So again, it goes along with what we read last week in Mark chapter 13 and verse 8, how it's just the beginning of the birth pangs. Yes, it was terrible. It was disgusting. Should never have happened. But it's only going to get worse. Everybody, everybody good? All right. And so um, uh, Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 and Daniel chapter 12 verse 11 describe that end time event. All right. So Three times that we see in Daniel, uh, again, one was here, Daniel 11:31, but then we see uh, something a little bit different in Daniel 9:27 and Daniel chapter 12 verse 11, speaking about a, a future judgment, a future judgment. After pretending to be a, a peacemaker by making an alliance with Israel, 
This Antichrist will turn against the Jewish people, massacring them and desecrating the temple for a period of three and a half years. Uh, Revelation chapter 11, verse 2, and Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. He will also make war with believers, Revelation chapter 13, verse 7, whether Jew or Gentile, killing many of their unwavering faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, everybody good? So far, so bueno? No problems? Okay, great. So uh, that's really it for the night. You guys have a good night. I tried. I tried. So we're going to move on. Uh, but uh, again, the abomination of desolation is, is literally speaking about Daniel. Uh, but we know that, that it is talking about in a twofold thing. So Daniel as in uh, the Antiochus Epiphanes, but also the Antichrist whom is to come, which has not come yet. Everybody, everybody's good, right? So I've got to ask you at this point, um, what is your um, eschatological standing in life? Are you a pre-trib? Are you a post-trib? Are you a mid-trib? All right? And, and so I'll explain those to you very quickly. And then I'll, I'll take a vote and see where we, uh, where we lie as a church. So mid-tribulation is the view that the church will be present for and go through the first half of the three and a half years of the tribulation. By the way, we understand the tribulation, the great tribulation to be seven years. But he, ra he is raptured out at the halfway point and so be absent for the latter three and a half years. The first half is seen as natural tribulation, whereas the second half is God's wrath, which is why some people believe that we will go halfway through the tribulation and then we will be raptured. Everybody understands rapture, right? That's when God will come back for his people and we will be floating in the air saying hi to each other and who knows where our clothes are, right? <laughs> Made up half of that. All right, so uh, that's that's mid that's mid tribulation. How about post trib? Post trib. So the church will go through the entire seven years of tribulation rather than being raptured out before or or in the middle of the tribulation. Thus, the rapture of the church and the resurrection of all dead saints occur at the same time at the end of the seven year tribulation. Okay, and now we have the pre trib, my personal favorite. The church is taken up or raptured just prior to the seven-year tribulation period. This time of tribulation is seen as unique in its intensity or severity, and so is called the Great Tribulation. To distinguish it from all other persecutions, trials, and tribulations the church goes through. And the church is exempt from it. Christ's second coming, then, is in two stages. The first, when Christ comes for the church and meets the church in the air. And the second, when Christ comes with the church to set up his kingdom and usher in the millennium. And so I ask you, uh, your eschatological view is what? Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. How many of you guys are pre-trib? You think you're not going through tribulation, you're out of here. All right, very good. How many of you are mid-trib? You're going to take it halfway and then call me home. I'm only good for halfway. We're like uh, Mark. He only made it halfway through the journey, and then he went on home. All right? We're, we got a couple of you. How many of us are post-trib? We're here for the duration. Ooh, we got two post-tribbers. If you two could just go on outside over there. Just, <laughs> just kidding. Most of us are pre-trib. Uh, and by the way, that is the standard Southern Baptist view. Southern Baptist uh, standard view is pre-trib. Let me ask you this. If I was to ask you to give me biblical foundation for your pre-trib viewpoints, would you be able to do that? Yeah, there are two. Now, what about if you are a mid, you midders? Could you give me a couple of uh, verses that would give you uh, that viewpoint? I'll help you out. The answer is yes. What if you are a post-trib? Everything is all done. You're here for the duration. Can you give me a couple of passages of Scripture that would, that would help you with that, Andy? No. No, just if you had time to research, could you? Yes, you could. That's, absolutely. There's about a couple for each viewpoint. Do you see where I'm going with this? Yeah. So us pre-tribbers are pre-tribbers because we really don't want to be here. Right? We do not want to be here for the great tribulation. Amen? Amen. And I am with you. I am with you. But I'm telling you, 
There, there really isn't too much more that we can look at that would lead us one way or another biblically. But uh, I'm praying. I am praying I am a pre-trib guy. Even if y'all aren't, I'm praying I am. All right? I'm just kidding. All right. Oh, man. Here we go. Verse 15. The one who is, oh, I'm sorry, the end of verse 14. It says, uh, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. All right, so we're talking about uh, the, the abomination of desolation. We're talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, yes. We're talking about the Maccabean Revolt, yes. But we're also talking about the second, and the, the, the real Antichrist that is coming that hasn't come yet. All right, it's kind of a twofer. Everybody likes two for these days. All right, you get a two for one. Here it is. We're talking about both of those, okay? And so, um, primarily, though, what we're talking about is, again, we're primarily talking about the Antichrist, who is, who is coming. Um, so, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. And so, it is saying this. Whenever this occurs, there is only one thing left to do. When the Antichrist comes, when, when he is here amongst us, there is literally only one thing to do, and that is panic. No, Run. Right? We are to run. Run so fast and so well, Forrest, that we see verse 15. The one who is on the housetop must not go down or go in to get anything out of his house. If you're on your rooftop, remember they are all flat. That's where they would go at night. They, they would have their prayer meetings, things like that, most of the time on the roof. All right. Again, they're flat. They're, they're, they're like your, your den. All right. They, that's where they would be. And they would be conversing. And the Antichrist comes comes takes over the temple what do we do we don't even go downstairs we jump off the roof and run to the mountains you understand what we're saying here that that is that is the type of reaction that you and i are to have all right any questions yet which mountain and how high is the roof that's that's what i want those are my two questions right those are my two questions which mountain and how high is the roof all right, verse 16, he goes on and he says, by the way, 16, 17, 18 are all to the same point. And the one who is in the field must not turn back to get his coat. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that it may not happen in the winter. The only safe reaction to the abomination of desolation is to escape from Jerusalem with urgency because the impending massacre will be so severe. As those closest to the temple, uh, the people living in Jerusalem and Judea at that time will find themselves in the greatest danger from the Antichrist. Though he will assert his deadly dominance over the entire world, his wrath will be aimed especially at the Jewish people, along with all believers everywhere. Everywhere. The word flee is uh, this word that we have seen before, fuego. We've talked about it before, uh, related to the English war, uh, term fugitive. Uh, light, uh, in light of the imminent threat, the only hope for Jerusalem's residents will, to be, will be to abandon the city and hide in the mountains. We, we see in Zechariah chapter 13, it might clear it up a little bit for us. And I do stress the word a little, but Ze Zechariah 13, 8 and 9 is speaking uh, to this. It says, and it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish, but the third will be left in it. And I bring the third part through the fire. I refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. And I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. The prophet Zechariah declares that only one-third of the Jewish population living in Judea at that time will survive. Those who successfully escape will come to saving faith, having been refined by God through the persecution inflicted on them by the Antichrist, as God himself promised in verse 9. They will call on my name, and I will answer them, and I will say they are my people, and they will say the Lord is my God. Verse 17, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing. Those who cannot make a quick escape, those who are not able to be quick on your feet and just uh, get up and take off running, it uh, may not end well or bode well for them. This is what it's talking about as well as the winter. Now the winter there is fairly mild, although it does snow on occasion. So it is talking about uh, if anything, the weather or whatever hindered you from 
literally running as fast as you could, it may not bode very well for you either. All right, so I think that the message is we are all to be track runners and high jumpers so we can make it off the roof. All right. Um, verse 19. I'll sum all this up at the end, by the way. Verse 19. For those days will be a time of tribulation, such as, as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation, which God created until now and never will. We seem to be quoting from Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Again, seems to be quoting from Daniel chapter 12, or at least alluding to Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. But it is no doubt telling us that the great tribulation will look like nothing else ever seen before. Various names for the, for the tribulation that I have found in scripture as I began to research this, I didn't even count them, there's a lot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Or eleven different names for the great tribulation that I found in the word of God. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 12 says, Day of the Lord. Isaiah 34 verse 8 says, Day of the vengeance of God. Jeremiah 30 verse 7 says, The time of Job's troubles. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, the 70th week of Daniel. Daniel chapter 12, verse 9 says the time of the end. Revelation 6, 17 says the great day of his wrath. Revelation 14, 7, the hour of his judgment. Matthew 13, 40 says the end of the world. Isaiah 26, 20 says the indignation. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, the desolation of abomination. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 the time of troubles as never before. If you want this piece of paper, you're more than welcome to get it. The point being this, it is so great, it takes 11 names to define the great tribulation that is going to occur. Something that we have never, ever seen before. The word of God says in verse 20, unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. That's how terrible this great tribulation will be. Seven years Seven years of great, great turmoil. Divided into threes. We're not going to get into that this evening. But seven and a half years of great, or seven years of great tribulation. The passage here in verse 20 is actually <clears throat> extremely interesting. Unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Had he had not Shorten the days, every single person on the planet would die. Every single person on the planet would die from the great tribulation. But instead of that, he has shortened it for us. This dreadful period will last for three and a half years, the first half, the same time span indeed as that it covered by the Lord's earthly ministry. The period is stated in various ways as the time and times and a half a time in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. It's also translated as 42 months in Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. And as 1,260 days in Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. Now that's what I'm talking about, by the way. Believers fleeing from the Antichrist and hiding in the hills and dens of the earth will actually be able to count from day to day how much longer the torment will last. Sometimes it's a little easier to know. I only have to hold out for 1,259 more days. Right? 1,258 more days. But there's an end. Right? There's an end. And I'll tell you, there's an end for us as well. There's an end for you and for me as well. And that's already been bought by the blood of Christ. So no matter what happens at the tribulation... No matter what your eschatological view is, no matter where you stand, God is still upon the throne. Amen. And when we die, whether it's in the great tribulation, whether it's before or whether we get called up, we are going to heaven and we are going to spend eternity there. Amen. Verse 23, and I'm, I'm just about done. Uh, let me read verse 22. For false Christ and false prophets will arise. Uh, 
and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, the elect. And we, we understand that passage. Um, we know that that's coming. We understand uh, that fine. So verse 23. But take heed, behold, I have told you everything in advance. The Lord warns the tribulation saints not to be duped by the devil. They have a more sure word of prophecy that you and I get in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. It says this, And so we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. What does that mean? That means you and I are to continue the good fight. To continue the good fight. We have God's word with its divinely given calendar by which to go. You and I have our days numbered. Our days are numbered by our Heavenly Father. And the end result will be the same no matter when it is in life. But here's the thing. And here's where I'm closing. And I, and I am closing here in just a minute. Here's where I'm closing this evening. You and I prayerfully here this evening have already the battle won for us. We have given our heart and our life to Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. Again, He has bought our lives with His blood upon the cross. But what about everyone else that is dying and going to hell every single day while we sit here in our church? Yeah. We need to get out and we need to be sharing the good news of Jesus Christ because they don't have the hope of pre-trip. They don't have that hope that we hold on to. All they have to hold on to is this world. What this world has to offer. And I'm telling you, and I know you know, and you know it probably better than I do, because I, I don't even watch TV. But you probably know it better than I do, that this world is, is literally falling apart from the seams. You know, we, we always say, it, every single Sunday, somebody tells me, I don't think our world can get any worse. Right? And then the next Sunday, between the Sundays, guess what? It got a little bit worse. It got a little bit worse. Every single Sunday, somebody tells me, I don't think it can get any worse. But the Word of God says it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. So you and I are called to something. You and I are called to share the good news of Jesus Christ. You and I are not only called to share the gospel, but we're also called to make disciples. And I hope and pray that that is what we are doing. And this evening, before we leave, here in just a moment, I'm going to have Randy come up, and I'm going to have him lead us, although we have a few extra minutes. And so I'll have you lead us in, in a prayer for the lost world as we pray. And as we, we do a great job of praying in our church, don't we? We really do a great job of praying in our church. But there is one thing that we're lacking as we pray. Every, every Sunday I sit there and I listen to the prayer request of the needs that we, we have and the needs that, that are coming up, and we do a great job at that. We really do. But there is one thing that we're missing. Anybody know what that is? We're not praying for the lost. We're not praying for the lost, right? We're praying for the saved, which is great, and we're called to do that, but we're also called to what? Pray for the lost. Pray for the lost, right? And so... Randy's going to start us on that tonight, and then uh, I think that maybe this is something we'll add on our, on our Sunday uh, prayer time. May we be praying for the lost world. If God would just put one person on your heart, just one person, right? Nam, Nam sent out this thing, who is your one? I didn't really like so much what they sent out with it, but, but the idea and the premise is good. Who, who is the one person that God has put upon your heart? Sure, you can think of maybe five or ten but it's difficult for us to actually be burdened with that many people. But you think about one person in your life that you know in contact with who is not a believer. That they have no hope beyond this. Even if we have to walk through the tribulation, we will walk through it together. Amen? We will have each other to hold on to. And the end result we have to look forward to. But they don't have that. They don't have that. So... Who is the one that God has put into your heart uh, this evening? And if you don't have that one, I have a few extra I could share. All right. So, uh, Brother Randy, will you come up and, and lead us praying for the lost? And then I'm just going to let you close us out. And after he's done praying, if you guys will do the invitation, and I'll be down front. Does that sound good? A little different, but I'm okay with different.
I like that shirt, by the way. Thank you. Thanks for the shirt. Well, and thank you, I thank R.J. Let's, let's bow together and let's do join our hearts in prayer. R.J.'s got me thinking a lot of different directions here right now. And God, I, I want to ask you, Father, what it is about temple. What if, Lord, have, have we lost our first love? God, I'm, I'm just reminded as R.J. shares that even now that times that we've got to be so excited about seeing people come to you and seeing people saved. God, we've seen a lot of really amazing different ways of that happening around here. And God, I, I remember a period of time where it seems like um, every time there was an invitation offered, somebody was up here. And we know you were in the middle of that, Lord. We know it was all the spirit at work and and people were were beginning to come to you and God not only that but it seemed like your people here we were challenged to go out beyond these walls and just try to mention your name in our daily walk just try to throw something in there about church something in there about Jesus that might give your Holy Spirit a chance to convict someone of of why you are like you are. Why, why, why would I say something like that to someone? And God, I'm reminded of just thinking a while back someone said that it, I don't remember just how it went, but it takes maybe a person seven different times to hear about Christ, maybe from seven different people to, to, for the Spirit to bring them to a place that they might literally pray and ask you to come into their heart and I don't know how accurate that is, Lord, but what that helped me think about is I might not get to be the seventh one. I might not get to lead somebody to Christ, but I might be a real crucial second one or, or fourth one in someone's life that, that is waiting for, for that conviction of the Spirit. And God, I just pray, I thank you for what RJ's thinking here. And God, help, help us here, help us, your people, to get excited about what the spirit can do in someone's heart god to remind us how what it was like when we were saved and what it took and maybe what what how someone went out of their way to help us to to stop and think about hmm maybe maybe i need christ in my life and god may, may you help us remember our day of salvation and and help us to step beyond any fears that we have to to get caught in a question we can't answer or or, or a, 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 a reason not to share god I, I pray that maybe starting right now as we leave this place you'll help us begin to pray every day for lost people pray every day that your spirit would convict someone we might sleep and slumber god but your spirit's always at work looking for an opportunity always at work and if we give him that opportunity he can do amazing things with it lord i pray that maybe tonight will start something here again at at this local church and that god will see someone accept christ i still love to get the visual of all the angels in heaven rejoicing when that happens over one one person that receives christ god may we continue to pray may we be faithful to pray and for loss may we be faithful to looking for opportunities may we very soon see that next person come to christ in this place or because of this place jesus we love you i pray that even now as we have a time of invitation lord prick our hearts with this in a serious way maybe some of us have never never even tried to get up enough gumption to to say Jesus' name in public and god may we may we ask you to help us with that and may someone leave out of here bolder than they've ever been in Christ. I thank you for Brother Leroy and him walking in this place tonight and saying we need to stand up and share Christ in our daily walks. And God, that's exactly what we need to do. So even as we have an invitation time here, Lord, may we join our hearts and pray together privately. God, if, if again, if people want to use these prayer benches to just kneel down and say, God, help me to do my part to help the Spirit have a chance to win somebody to Christ. 
May we, whether we pick a name, think of someone, or we just pray for a lost person to get saved, God, may we do that together. Would you use this invitation time, God, to honor you and to help us think about our first love? And if we've got away from our first love, God, help us to return to it. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.